I keep getting phone calls in the middle of the night. They wake me up, but I don't have the reception. <laughs> like it's here, six calls. <laughs> You don't know from Unknown. <laughs> okay. It's a kangaroo probably. <laughs> Some ghost. Okay, so I'm gonna get ahead a bit and just I just decided to bring in a bit more of graphical models because I will use them a little bit to illustrate, so I would like us to all be on the same page. Um, one example that I so there's three cases you need to Keep in mind, uh, so we've seen this case, we've seen case one where if it's cloudy, it rains, and you get wet, okay? And the independence here being that W is independent of clouds given that it's raining, okay? If you know it's raining, you don't need to know whether it's cloudy. Um, another case, there's two more cases you need to know about of conditional independences. And then there's a way of formalizing all this. Um, we saw this case. We've actually seen both of those cases encoded in the graph before. Um, this case here says whether there's rain or a shower, you could get wet. Okay? This is not causality, by the way. Again, I emphasize that these are correlations. These are dependencies. Okay? For the causality, you need the counterfactual. You need to consider the other possible thing. Um, so here, suppose you're trying to decide whether it's raining or not, okay? And you know you observe that it's wet. So we shade to indicate that it's observed. So you know the state of wet, okay? You happen to be wet. You're covered in water. Is it raining? Well, it would help to know whether you're in the shower or not. So, in this case, um, oh, sorry, this should be independent. In this case, you say that rain is dependent on shower given wet. Okay? And then the last example was the thing of the frogs and wet and rain. And that basically says that wet is, whether you're wet or not, does not depend on the state of frogs out there if you know it's raining. Um, actually, the perpendicular means independent, so dependent, I guess, would be the cross pattern. Yeah, independent means independent. Oh, the perpendicular is... The symbol is, does mean independent. Okay, I'm just going to redefine the symbols. This symbol means... <laughs> <laughs> a word is just a word. In the words of Karen. This means independent. Oh, that's true. You're correct. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> w is given R, these guys are independent. Given R, these two guys are independent. Uh, but watch out for this case, because this case is different. Okay. okay. So, this defines something called and here's a more like a typical graphical model, which has many nodes, and it indicates, you know, people will construct these huge graphical models to tell you how variables depend on variables. And you learn the structure of these graphical models. And hopefully next week you'll see a bit of that. You can learn the structure of these graphical models. You learn all the conditional probability tables, and you learn all of these things. Um, and for, for, sort of, for this type of network, it can all be learned, this type of size. For larger networks, you need to use some of the inference techniques, like some of the ones I'll mention here today. Um, where else? Okay, so one thing that's kind of starting to kind of 
matter that you kind of can see parents. So let's call children as the descendants and parents the guys on top. Parents kind of matter, are important. Children are important. The other child's parent is also important. Okay. When you put all this together, you get something called uh, the Markov blanket. So here's a graphical model that was uh, popularized by Judith Pearl in L.A., um, again, the nodes are random variables. The edges indicate, again, causation, quotation marks, because it's not a causation. Okay, so, you know, aliens come to Earth, they found this device, the device points in one direction, they follow this direction, and they find a polar bear. And... <laughs> And then they repeat this experiment, and 90%, 97.8% of the times, they follow this arrow and they find a polar bear, and they conclude that this is a polar bear indicator. <laughs> so correlations is not causation. Um, the device being a North Pole pointer. Um, now... The, the semantics that we will have is that your a variable will depend will be independent of the ancestors, given the parents. So call, given alarm, using that, will be independent of all these variables. <coughs> if you know, um, again, there's so the situation is there's an earthquake. Could you're driving home? And in order to know whether there's an earthquake, well, you switch on the radio to know whether there's the radio announcing an earthquake in L.A. or not. Or if the alarm burglary goes off in your home and it calls your cell phone, uh, you get an alarm. So you also know that there's a chance that there could be... Uh, so the alarm in your cell phone could either be caused because there's an earthquake, so the house shakes, or because a thief comes in. And based on the alarm, you get a cell phone call. And what you're trying to establish here is what's going on okay, when, when you receive this call. Okay, so you receive this call. Well, knowing, so we can see this case, um, the one case arising, where knowing the status of the radio would help you know whether there's an earthquake or a burglary. Okay, because if you switch on the radio and it tells you, yes, there's been an earthquake, then you kind of know that burglary is less probable. So in particular, suppose you have a call, so you shade that variable to indicate you have a call, and we're computing the probabilities. We're doing inference here. We're just doing the marginalization task. Uh, we're computing the probability of an earthquake given that you've received a call. The probability that earthquake is true given that the you've received a call. Call is true. And initially, you might have 0 0.1, 0, and... And you might have the probability of a burglary being true being 0 0.7 because, after all, this is L.A. You'd rather, you would, there's more burglaries than earthquakes. So this is your prior status of the world. Then you observe the variable radio. Okay, and the radio says, um, everybody, you know, do whatever you can do to save your lives. There's an earthquake. And based on that, automatically... You recompute these probabilities, the probability of an earthquake, now that given that there was, you received a call, and given that the radio confirmed that there was an earthquake, now it goes to 0.97, and that goes to 0.1. And I guess the reason why it's stochastic and it doesn't go to 1 is because the thieves might um, <laughs> have hooked their devices into the radio so that they could uh, tamper with your home. And this is called a sort of explaining away effect. Once you have a variable, it helps explain the other. And that's as much as I'll say about graphical models because um, you will get this, uh, um, you will get a, a whole lecture on this next week. And I need to go back to Monte Carlo.
Okay. So, by the way, if there's anything that's sort of not clear with any of these operations I'm doing here, or with the graphical models, the semantics, um, you know where to find me at lunch, uh, down at the beach, on the sand. <laughs> Bring a stick. <laughs> we'll, we'll go over this. Um, another thing, I'm making uh, edits on the slides, and I added a couple of slides last yesterday. Um, so I'm going to make the new set of slides available um, at the end of this meeting. Actually, during the meeting already, we can copy it. Okay, so let's go to the case of expectation. We have a there's an unknown x. We have some data. We have been able to learn the. Post let's assume we've estimated a posterior distribution of the unknown given the data so far. And what we're interested in is in computing the expectation of a function. Okay? F of x could be just x, in which case we just want the mean of the posterior. Or if we're interested in the variance, we would have x minus the mean and so on. So the idea is f of x could be something that allows you to get any properties of this distribution. Um, so this is how we do it. This is how we do Monte Carlo for these problems. We simulate a bunch of points from this distribution. Okay? And I'll soon explain how we do In fact, that's the whole point of this, these lectures, is how to do that simulation. But let's assume that we have done the simulation. So you have a bunch of points that you've simulated, and sort of where there's higher probability, you've generated these things. So it's kind of think of this as the inverse. In learning, we have these data points, and we try to come up with this kernel density estimate. That's what... Uh, we were doing yesterday. Now we're doing the opposite. We have the distribution. We generate the data. Okay? Um, in fact, and you could use this to publish papers because you generate the data and then you say that this is your solution to it and uh, it will, you'll get a very good fit. There was a NIPS paper that did that uh, called data, data Set Selection. So basically, you, gener you come up with a model, generate the data from the model, and then you reconstruct the model from that data. The sad thing is that there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> a lot of people generate data with their model and then reconstruct the data with the same model, and, oh, it works very well. Surprise. <laughs> okay. Once we've sampled these points, we bend them in some sort of way. And for simplicity, let's say that we're doing then a histogram binning. Okay? And that bin approximation gives us an approximation to this to the posterior distribution. Okay? So we have an approximation of P of X given data in green. Um, in reality, we don't need to construct this approximation to solve an integral. That's that's kind of that's very, very important point. Because constructing a kernel density estimation in very high dimensions, it's, it's not going to make any sense. All we want is samples to compute this. Again, if this guy is replaced by a delta function, say if we care about the mean, mentioned this yesterday, if we replace this by a delta function at the mean, then you only need one sample to do this. We care about this guy, the estimate. We don't care so much about P of X given a theta, unless we really care about it. But in general, we focus on the estimate. And, and so basically what we do is the same thing. Um, this basically, you could think of this, the bins are just delta functions. You could replace the center of the bin by a delta function. And the delta function... Let's pick a nice color, blue... So there's a delta function here of size 2, a delta function of size 4, uh, maybe a delta function of size 3, and one of size 2, and then one of size 1. So you're replacing the distribution by this delta representation, and then again by the properties of the delta function, when you replace all these delta functions here, all you get is the function evaluated at each of those delta functions. So the Monte Carlo estimate then, this thing will be replaced just by the sum of i equal 1 to n 
1 over n of f of x i. Okay. That's Monte Carlo integration. I'm going to redo it here because, I mean, that, that's it. That's pretty much the most important thing. So we have I equal, let's suppose that we want the mean. Let's say mu equal X, P of X given data DX. And what we do is we construct an approximation of P of X given data, which will be equal, a his, it's a bunch of delta functions. Oh, we normalize this so that they sum to 1 because we have probabilities. That's why I have the 1 over n. And it's delta x, whatever the sample occurs, xi. These are the xi points. And we're binning. So basically what we're doing is we're taking an interval dx. an infinitesimal interval dx, and in this dx, we're counting how many samples there are. So in this case, there are three, and then n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So here you get a 3 over 12. Um, and so on. So in general, this is just, we write this, this is the notation we use. We're saying this is just a counter of how many particles have fallen in the box dx. Okay? And that gives us the probability, and I'm going to put it here at dx, that gives us the probability that you fall in the interval dx. Okay? The probability that you're in the interval dx, which is what we're trying to estimate, is just the number of samples that fall in that interval. And we take this guy, we replace it here, and there's one more thing. One thing about probability that actually I was trying to avoid, but we're going to need it. In probability, if we have an interval, dx, and we have a density function, p of x, as a function of x. So we have, say, a distribution. We're looking at an interval of width dx. The height is p of x. This height here is uh, p of x. The density. The area is with the probability. This area here gives us something, the probability of falling in that interval. And in general, with some abuse of notation, the probability of the interval is the length of the interval times the density, the height. Okay? Probability is density times the measure. With some abuse of notation. In general, with probabilities, we don't use the Riemann integral. We use the Lebesgue integral. Who's seen the Lebesgue integral? Uh, two of you. Um, but anyway, it's kind of a similar thing. It's just a way of measuring length. Um, and, and it's something that allows you a generalization, which applies for discrete and continuous data. So you have the measures are taken into account. And so probability of falling in that interval is just the height of the interval by the area. So the probability is the area. It's like the cumulative. The cumulative is the area under the density. And what we're estimating is indeed this, this area here, the area of this box. The probability that you fall in that box is the area of the box, just like we had in the beginning, the darts. Again, probability is always a thing of measuring. Um, so this, we're trying to estimate this, and this quite often, in many papers, not in the machine learning literature, but if you go and look at Monte Carlo papers and statistics, you'll often see this written as X, PDX. Okay? 
But now you know it means the same thing because it's just replayed. Um, sorry, PDX given data. You just replace the density times the measure by the probability. Okay, and it's the same thing. If you're doing non-parametric statistics like the Richler processes, um, to understand that literature, you also need to know that another way of writing this thing is x dp dx given d. It's just different notation, same stuff. Okay. Um, it's just you know, if you know the notation, then when you start page one of the paper, you don't like, oh my god, <laughs> throw it out. Um, okay. So that's another way of writing the integral. So in a way, we, instead of take, measuring with respect to the intervals in the x-axis, we're measuring with respect to the intervals in, in this area, uh, areas of probabilities. We're summing areas of probabilities as opposed to summing intervals in x. Um, so then what we do, basically, is we take this guy and we replace it here. So we get an estimator of mu, which is the integral of x times 1 over n sum i equal 1 to n delta xi dx. And by the property of the impulse function, again, that this thing is only true when you're at xi, okay, when, you, when you're at that spike. So this will be zero elsewhere. So it's only when you're at xi that there is something to be added in the integral. So, so hence you get 1 over n xi. Okay. And this is just a standard estimator of the mean. You flip a coin many times and you count how many times it comes heads, how many times it comes tails. And this would be over i equal 1 to n. The Monte Carlo estimator is not the only one. There's other estimators. And um, tomorrow I think I'll mention some of them because uh, maybe Alex will provide introduction to them if he does GPs. Alex? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Very briefly, okay. There's, there's other ways of doing these. Like some people put a distribution on this, for example, and through that they manage to do some analytical bits of this. And, but this is sort of the cheap, easy way of doing all this stuff. Not the best always, but certainly cheap. Um, and it's, it's an average. It's an ergodic average. So the laws of large numbers apply. You can get central limit theorems. We know this is all kosher. And this is the problem. We don't know how to sample, how to generate those samples. If you knew how to generate those samples, there would be no curse of dimensionality, there would be no problem. Monte Carlo has no curse of dimensionality in it, mainly because of this thing. If you knew how to generate the samples, even in 10 gazillion dimensions, if you put the samples in the right place, you can do it. But uh, we don't know how to get those samples. Okay. Um, I guess this is just summary that you can read. Again, this is the sort of delta measure, the histogram representation. And this is just what we did now for, for recap. I had forgotten I had this slide. Again, it's a question of taking this guy, replacing it here, and voila, your job is done. But then you don't have a curse of dimension, and it's sort of a little bit oversimplifying, because I mean, high dimensions, your function is typically much more fragile, and you need much more samples. No, like but the thing is... expectation, for instance, if you want to compute the expectation of a function which is a Gaussian or something, yeah? just do it manically, I mean, the higher the dimension, the more samples. <coughs> no, if you had one sample positioned at the mean in high dimensions, then that would give you the mean estimate. Uh, okay, but... <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Okay. So it's positioning the samples that is hard. So I've, ju I've just kind of washed yeah. the problem into another problem. But I haven't solved it. You're correct. And so now we're going to try to solve the other problem. 
and keep the Monte Carlo list. <coughs> okay, so that's pretty much the idea. You replace that histogram estimator, and just so that you have it in your notes, then you end up with f of x, and this becomes an approximation now, f of x times 1 over n, sum from i equal 1 to n, delta x i dx, and so you get the estimator will be just 1 over n, i equal 1 to n, f of x i. And this sometimes we ref sometimes we refer to this as uh, the estimator based on n samples of the function. Okay, so I don't know what that was. Monte Carlo can also be used for optimization, and um, so sometimes. Well, if you had lots of samples, if you draw a thousand samples from a distribution, then you can look at their, their heights and you pick the highest. That's one way of thinking of optimization. Um, a better way is that to make sure that when you draw the samples, that the samples concentrate at the peaks. Okay? And we're going to see several ways of doing that. One of them that's very popular is simulated annealing, where the samples try to concentrate at the peak of the distribution. Because what you care there is about optimization. It's about finding the peak. You don't care about integration. You just care about finding the max. Okay. So now let's look at the first basic technique for generating the samples. And it's called rejection sampling. The algorithm is very simple. And it works as follows. Um, you iterate these steps. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to construct another distribution, Q of X. So Q of X is a nice distribution. Think of it as a Gaussian. We know how to draw samples from a Gaussian distribution. Okay, MATLAB is just random, and you can generate a sample from a Gaussian distribution. So Q of X is a friendly distribution. Again, I'm, washing, I'm moving the problem somewhere else. I'm moving the problem to one of choosing a good Q of X. But let's assume we have a good Q of X for the time being. And I'm going to draw a number uniformly between 0 and 1. In MATLAB, just say x equals rand 1, 1. Or same thing in Python. I'm going to use MATLAB for this. Uh, how many people know MATLAB? Python? OK, good. You're moving. <laughs> Python's the way. <laughs> I still have every, all my demos in MATLAB, unfortunately. Okay, and so what we're going to do then is we're going to generate, um, we generate xi and we generate u. And what we, xi's are the samples that we care. So we generate them from q and then we're going to weight them in a way so that they are actually samples from p. Okay, that's the trick. Generate from something that's easy, weight them in some sort of way so that they become samples of p. Because once there you have samples of p, then you can solve all the expectations. So first we need to, well, almost all the expectations. Um, the technique we're going to do is we're going to come up with a big number, m, and I'll mention what this m is later. Um, that's going, and we're going to accept a sample xi. It's going to be only a valid sample if p is sort of much larger than m q of x. So let me kind of give you an illustration of this. We try to come up with a distribution Q of X, and we multiply it by a number to ensure that this Q of X will sort of dominate P of X, okay, so that it provides a good cover. In particular, one necessary condition is that I can't have Q of X be zero in a region where P of X is not zero, okay, because that wouldn't make sense, because then you will never generate samples there, where Q of X is zero, and so you will never get a good estimate of Q of P of X. Sorry, what's the M? Just some standard to bring it up on both sides. M, 
M is just a scalar, yeah. And how do you choose it? Uh, a large number. But the larger it is, the worse it gets. Um, let me first show you the algorithm, and then it should be obvious why it is the case. I draw a sample. Oops, sorry, this is a bit low. Maybe if we could just raise it for the time being. Okay. I draw a sample from Q of X from the blue distribution. You sample a number from a Gaussian distribution. So that's easy. Just xi is equal to randn, 1, 1, and then you multiply that by m. So um, then when I drew that sample, I'm going, to take a, I'm going to take an interval between the zero value and the value of the function m times q of xi. Okay, so this height here would be m q of x i. So you have to evaluate, so we're basically evaluating the Gaussian at that point. Assumption that you can evaluate q of x. In some problems in econometrics, that's not true. You, you, sometimes you can't evaluate the type of distributions. In machine learning, often that's true. Once you have that, we draw a random number uniformly between here and here. The way you do that is you just draw a number between 0 and 1, uh, x equal rand, and then you, then you evaluate m times q of x, and then you multiply that times that number, and that gives you that number there in the vertical axis. Um, if the number is above the red line, if u is above the red line, you throw it away. If it's below, you accept it. Okay, so that one we throw away. We pick another one. Oh, it's inside, so we accept it. Oh, it's inside, we accept it. And if you keep doing that, it sort of should work that where this is high, there'll be a high probability of these guys being accepted. As long as I have a sensible Q of X. Okay. Um, and I, I'm going to give you a, sh a demo of that. So in MATLAB, uh, you need to specify the number of iterations. Um, oh, God, this was a long time ago. The mean, the number of bins, the mean and the variances of the proposal distribution, and so on. But let me move to the algorithm. Again, the algorithm is just this. You generate a random number between 0 and 1. That's your U. You generate this proposal distribution from Q, from the Gaussian distribution. Q has mean MQ, variance SQ, and this is just a Gaussian number the, from a Gaussian distribution. Um, you evaluate the target distribution. We usually talk about the distribution of interest as the target distribution. Um, the target is just um, a bimodal Gaussian distribution. Zero, it's a Gaussian distribution with the mean at zero with weight 0.3, and then there's another Gaussian distribution at, with mean 10 and weight 0 0.7. So it's a sort of bimodal distribution, just like in the example we saw now. The proposal is a single Gaussian, which has mean MQ, so these match, and has variance SQ, standard deviation SQ. And then what we do is we evaluate uh, P of X of a M Q of X, like I had before, um, the acceptance. 1e e to the minus 99 is because, unfortunately, computers are discrete devices. They're not continuous devices, so you have to deal with conditioning. Um, and then if, if U is less than alpha, in other words, if U is less than that height, you accept. If it's not... 
you throw it away. Okay? This ensures that it's between the blue line and the red line in the plot. Uh, if you reject, you do nothing. And then the rest is just plotting. And if you run this, so you draw a sample. That's not a good one. Oh, actually, that's a good one. Yeah, that's below. <laughs> oh, no, first you pick on the x-axis. Then you pick a uniform number. You reject it. And then that one you accept. So now you've got the approximation of the posterior distribution. The target distribution, the posterior distribution, is this bimodal thing. M, Q of X is the red thing. And this is the approximation. So with two samples, we have a pretty lousy approximation of it. Um, and then you continue doing this thing, ta 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 Rejection, okay, I'm doing this on purpose so that you see the rejection sampling is really inefficient. It takes forever. <laughs> and if you keep doing this, it actually starts work. It's slightly faster in C, but it would help if I wasn't plotting it always, too. So bit by bit, you know, the magic works. And you get an approximation after 100 samples that it starts looking a lot better than... It starts looking like the, a good approximation of the posterior distribution. Um, why is this bad? For a cookie, what's an obvious problem with this approach? That's with the cookie. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer, first answer is that you're throwing away a lot of samples. Another cookie. Why are we throwing away lots of samples? What will make you throw away lots of samples? That is true, too. <laughs> so, if Q of X provides a tight envelope for P of X, we're doing well. If that's not the case, not so much. You could waste a lot of samples. When does that happen? This That is true. If you choose, why would you need to choose a large M, though? So that it uh, covers the actual population. When would you? When would it be tricky to cover the population? What are the two situations? You're getting there. <laughs> what sort of distributions are hard to cover? That's one solution. That's one problem. High dimensions. Why? <laughs> Marcus gave you the answer yesterday. The ball in the middle? So it's, Marcus actually gave you a very good intuition for this yesterday with the ball inside in the middle, which is, if you're going high dimensions, this is an exercise in the Bishop book, chapter one, do it, to convince yourself. Um, a Gaussian in high dimensions, for example, will have all its mass concentrated in a, sort of in a thin shell about the radius. Where the high density is, that's not what the mass is. There, and the intuition being that, think of tails, Suppose you're interested in the tails of a distribution. If you want to sum 
the probability, you look at the, the tail probability of a distribution, in 2D, you just, the ratio of the tails to, the, to most of the mass is just happens to be the shaded area to this area, and it's going to be kind of small. But as you go to higher dimensions, you know, and you have a Gaussian in 2D with tails, now, now you're summing area, the area over which you're summing, because you've spread the dimension, is larger. And in fact, it's kind of, I suppose the 3D still doesn't give you that sort of picture. But now you're taking a whole circumference, and you're not just adding up two directions, but you're actually adding two pi directions. There's a lot more little areas. So all of a sudden, more and more, this area actually starts dominating this area as you keep growing. So this is what we call the concentration of measures. Things are concentrating on this radius, and most of the probability will be in that area of the tails. Now, important sampling, sorry, rejection sampling, try to provide a good covering of this. The issue is here. This is where the problem is, in the tails. This is where it will get nasty. Um, because in the tails, as we go to high dimension, it will be very likely that you will not have assigned enough probability with Q to guarantee at the region of high probability of P. You know, it will be very hard to get this blue thing to dominate this. So to do that, you would have to crank up the M. But by cranking up the M, you increase the rejection rate. So you'll end up rejection, rejecting most of the samples. What is high dimensions in this case? I don't know, six dimensions. It depends on the model. Six, ten dimensions, this method fails. Okay, so it, but, hey, if you have one or two dimensions and you want to do something very quickly and dirty... This will do the job, like, like you just saw. Also, the, the second case, it's got to do with outliers. When you have outliers, these distributions tend to be heavy-tailed. Okay? What? Yeah. Should we have to make sure that MQX should dominate BX? Means it should be All over the space. All over the space. Yeah. How will we make sure that? By cranking up M. And so your algorithm gets bad. <coughs> as a result. <laughs> Eventually, you can't make sure of it. So with high dimensions, you can't make sure that that's going to be the case unless you have a stupidly high M. And it's, again, the case if you have heavy tail distributions. If you have outliers, if you have a typical cases, cases that occur here, usually a Gaussian has this tail that decreases exponentially fast. But quite often in a lot of data, you actually have outliers. Um, uh, actually, outliers are more common than, than you would think. Um, Google lives on outliers. It's, in business, they call it the long tail. Uh, statisticians refer to this as heavy tails. There's a lot of data in those tails. And you need to be able to cover that because that's the area of high probability of interest. And unless you have a very large M, that's uh, not going to be the case. But, of course, if M becomes very large, as was already pointed out by you, in fact, you would get a lot of rejection. In fact, for pointing that out, here's a cookie. Whoa. <laughs> mm -hmm. What's the Q is not a uniform? Q is not a uniform? Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so why did I use a gas in not a uniform? I don't even need to teach. With cookies, you can get everything done. Whoa. <laughs> Make sense? But how do you choose good cues? That's going to be soon a topic of... Uh, that we, it's going to arise in also when we do it with the other methods. Coming up with good cues is important. So let's look at important sampling now. When do I break? In five minutes? Okay. We've had question and answer already. <laughs> okay, so 
Important sampling. Important sampling works a lot better than rejection sampling. In a way, you keep all the samples, and you just weight them. Okay? And the way it works is um, as follows. Actually, I put the writing here, but I'd like to write it down. So assume we have, again, we're trying to do compute an estimate, which is the integral of f of x, uh, p, p of x, dx, Okay, and recall, so what we're going to do then, because we don't know how to draw samples from P of X, is we're going to draw samples from Q of X and we're going to reweight. So we're going to rewrite this as the integral of F of X times P of X over Q of X times Q of X dx. Okay? So multiply and divide by q of x. And this guy I'm going to call the weight, the importance weight, w. So this is now the integral of f of x times w of x times q of x dx. Now, if I draw samples from q of x for i equal 1 to n. So if I draw n samples from q of x, my new Monte Carlo estimator, i n of f, is going to be equal to who wants to take a guess? <laughs> That's it. I I cut it at two cookies. <laughs> One over n sum. <laughs> you have lunch. <laughs> Okay, it makes sense, because f of x, w of x, you could just think of this as yet another function, g of x, and it's just, all you're doing now is, again, simple Monte Carlo integration, where now the function that you're integrating with respect is actually f of x times w of x. Okay? And that gives us the Monte Carlo, the important sampler estimate. That's assuming we know the normalization constant of P. That's assuming we can really evaluate W of X. That's the assumption. Again, Q of X should dominate P of X, should be 